The Year A Royal Dream Came True, written by Jason Sivright, illustrated by Kevin and Kristen Howdeshell. Coast to coast the word spread, traveling out from the plains. Those brave boys in blue weren't a joke they could play. They didn't play like most played, nor look like most looked, with hundreds of homers and stuffed pocketbooks. They played as a team, one man for the next, and their victories left the land feeling perplexed. So it was, some determined the belief of a kook, that our team from KC was much more than a fluke. The new season came near as Dayton the Great took his place at the helm of the Royal Blue Gates. Sir Kendry, San Rios donned helmets of blue, Eddie V lost his sea legs to pitch for our crew. With good reason, the city of Fount swelled with hope, yet the scribes in the land still believed we were dopes. You'd think last year's magic would clearly have taught them, but they picked Casey finishing down near the bottom. Undeterred, Skipper Ned flashed a coy, wrinkled grin and led his team out, claiming win after win. Too bad Big Game James had his feet in the sand because our boys needed shields as their season began. From the city of Wynn came a team with dark socks whose footwear and name seemed as mixed as their thoughts. They thought us a pest, our boys from the plains. Not a team to regard, just a royal blue pain. So out from KC rose a cry for respect, but it sure wouldn't come from Bean's boys way out west. They'd hired a hitter with long tattooed sleeves and out from his ears shot hot puffs of steam. A swipe to the legs knocked us down for a while, but like a true all-star, Eski came back in style. With Herrera and Wade, Moose, Salvi, and Kane, and Gordo all stood with the best in the game. Half the season was gone, joined with anyone's doubts as the Central turned into a royal blue route. Chief Cleave and those twins fought for spot number two as we sped on ahead because that's still what speed do. Dayton gathered in Cueto from his life of sin sin. He moved to KC alongside Valiant Ben. Skipper Ned set his sights on claiming home field. Though the road would get rocky, he never would yield. The bluebirds up north gave the race some intrigue, but as leaves began falling, we still held league lead. So 10 flags were hoisted and 10 spots were claimed and all the land wondered which one would remain. At the tourney's beginning, it seemed our last hour as those heroes in blue faced a meteor shower. The Strohs from down south had a whiz for an ace, shooting strikes from his beard that were perfectly placed. Game four, we thought surely our hope had run dry, for those Strohs were as hot as the stars in the sky. In the seventh, they shot out two bombs back to back. Nothing would calm their relentless attack. Twas the top of the eighth when it happened again. No sane soul believed we could come back and win. But it turned out our boys weren't that sane after all. Though down six to two, they would see those strows fall. First Rio singled, then Eski, then Ben. Kane drove Rios home, Hosmer drove Eski in. While the strows tried to figure out what they were doing, KC simply kept the royal line moving. Around and around the bases we went, now it was our team that would not relent. As the dust slowly settled back down to the ground, those young shooting stars found themselves one run down. Though Wade never needed much more than one run, Prince Hosmer decided the time had now come. With a silencing homer, he declared the game over. Oh, remember, remember, the 12th of October. Joey the Bluebird was our next fearful foe. It took a few comebacks to keep him in tow. Fancy bat flips were his greatest endeavor, yet slowly but surely we plucked all his feathers. Where 10 flags once flew, now just two could be seen. One showed a big apple and the other KC. That team from New York had tricks up their sleeve. Though their aces were great, they had none to relieve. On a cool night in Queens, they played game number five. The big apple determined to keep hopes alive. Eddie V took the mound for our Destin Blue crew. He would keep the game close, only giving up two. In the top of the ninth, their ace Harvey stayed in, determined himself to secure New York's win. With a walk to Locaine and a shot off the wall, it became very clear that was not a great call. Hosmer did it again, and on third he now stood, 
Then he made a call that seemed not very good. Salvi grounded to third, and Haas headed home. There must have been cobwebs in his crazy-haired dome. As all of KC stood holding his breath, some believing the best, others scared half to death, Hosmer slid safe at home as the throw sailed on by to the end of the ninth, and the game was now tied. Our bullpen was mighty, the big apples was rotten, and if this was a fact that some had forgotten, they'd be soon reminded by Herrera and Hoach, the 9th, 10th, and 11th. New York hung zeros. In the 12th, Salvi singled, Dice stole, then Cologne hit a shot to left to bring Dyson on home. A double from Eski, a double from Kane, put Casey up five, and the fat lady sang. Like no team before, they embodied the words that when first were spoken seemed just plain absurd. On the first of November and through all of October, you could hear Yogi say, it ain't over till it's over. And for every one reason to give up on a dream, they gave us 1738 reasons to believe. Our boys claim the crown and return to us champs as 800,000 line the streets for their chance to say thanks to what George deemed the team of all teams. Now they'll say, let's all party like 2015.